1622. The Jamestown colony of the English Virginia Company had well surpassed the population of 1,000 and was on its way to 2,000. The presence of the English in the area were at first accepted by the native Powhatan, who traded with them for metal tools and old world materials. Every day, the Powhatan would enter the town to interact with the settlers and sell their furs. Native children would play with English children, and adults would share meals, the food often gifts from the natives or bought in trade. All was most certainly not well though. One such day, Powhatan warriors entered the settlement as always. Then, suddenly, and without warning, they grabbed whatever they could find that would work as a weapon and attacked the English. The warriors killed 347 settlers in the Jamestown Massacre, a quarter of the English population in the Virginia colonies. In many cases, in fact in most cases, these were defenseless, innocent people. I don't mean to cast any moral judgment over this event. I believe that retrospectively analyzing history and trying to assign blame and declaring characters to be villains and heroes is fundamentally misguided. The English had certainly committed provocations of their own. Relations between the Powhatan and the settlers had soured when the English's over-reliance on native help for feeding their population had caused parties of Englishmen to demand food and raid villages, and uh, they certainly did not stop the threats. But I want to highlight the nature of the conflict that took place in the Americas, specifically how it was a conflict between two groups where one has a significant advantage in power. The Europeans had guns, they had metal, large vessels, and sophisticated building techniques. On top of that, they brought with them diseases that likely determined the outcome of battles before any fighting actually began. These conflicts were, at their core, a war between a stronger power and a weaker one. But it wasn't always this way. When the English first settled in North America, around the halfway point of the second millennium, their weapons were much more primitive, and they had so little manpower that in many cases they just couldn't feed themselves. Early on, the Native Americans were more powerful than the English in aggregate. It is this kind of conflict that occurs in Reaper, Tale of a Pale Swordsman, a game developed by primarily mobile developer Hexage. Ships of the Imperium land in the wilderness, a land of magic-wielding tribes and aggressive fauna. However, the history of the wilderness is the opposite of our own. The Imperial force is at first unstoppable, quickly taking land and setting up industrial operations in the region. The Zabas tribe falls first, close to the Imperium settlements and largely a tribe of pumpkin farmers. They reluctantly give in to the Imperial forces, casting out those who wish to continue the war. From this foothold, the Imperium advances on the rest of the wilderness. The Wilderlings are powerless, but they're no match for the Imperial war machines. Then, the Imperium discovers Fluidium in the mountains of the wilderness, a magical fluid that allows them to build even more powerful machines. The Imperium lusts after it, setting up mines to extract the resource in the isolated and dangerous southern regions. However, what the Imperial War Machine felt to recognize was the significance of Fluidium to Wilderling magic. As it's extracted from the ground, the magic is released, and with it the magical power of the tribes grows. The Wilderlings raise armies of the dead, give life to stones, and are now able to put up a serious resistance to the Imperial advance. In response, the military men in charge of the colonization only increase their effort. More troops, more machines, and of course, more fluidium, perpetuating a losing cycle. As it quickly becomes evident that the Wilderlings were becoming more and more powerful, a long-term fear begins to set in for the Imperial monarchy and citizenry. A wilderness so full of magic and tribes so powerful that they can not only repel the advance, but become a threat to the homeland, lobbing magical projectiles across the ocean. With Wilderlings weary and the Imperium afraid of long-term consequences, a sort of stalemate is reached. Imperial forces defend the little land they still held onto, trying to maintain their industrial operations. It is in this eye of the storm that a hooded swordsman awakes in an abandoned cave. The actual gameplay of Reaper is quite simple at its heart. The swordsman swings his weapon automatically when in range, in combination with a number of abilities. A dash with no invincibility frames, a slam and an uppercut, which sends enemies flying, a stomp into the ground from the air and a whirlwind spin attack. Part of this simplicity is that this game was originally designed to be played on mobile, but the result is that the combat here is deceptively simple and can be enormously satisfying when you learn how to play it. Reaper excels when you're fighting many enemies at once, because it's in these situations that you can use the full extent of your abilities. The effectiveness of those abilities fall off with the fewer enemies that there are, meaning that you fall back on your auto attack. Since you have no control over the timing of that attack, this kind of combat can feel pretty bad. 
One thing that I really like in this game is the enemy variety, with many different types of foes to go up against that change depending on the location of the map and the specifics of that fight. Fighting members of the Torkin tribe who have weak magic, you're confronted with much stronger melee opponents and neutered magic ones. There are significantly few respecters and runestones in Torkin fights as well, since the story emphasizes how this tribe has fewer of those warriors due to their weaker magic. Fighting the beast of this game is also distinct. There are many more enemies that attack with their whole bodies, and the demons that show up later find the middle ground between the two, which is consistent with their nature as neither man nor beast. Then, the Imperium troops also have their distinct styles, using longer range weapons and guns, plus gyrocopters and eventually their machines. The Stormers, elite Imperium soldiers, are variants of those same Imperium abilities that are meaningfully changed to be stronger not just in raw stats, but also in abilities. The Stormer gunman has an automatic weapon that fires three rounds in a row instead of a single shot that the normal gunman has. This game also uses size variation, with larger enemies being more powerful. The extra danger of these enemies means that I have to change my playstyle to adapt to them, either changing my approach away from a direct assault or focusing on finishing them off first. I love when games do this, create simple variations on their enemies with either size or color or variation along some other dimension. It means that not only is there additional variety in gameplay, fighting each enemy feels unique in a way that makes the fight have more impact and become memorable. Monster Hunter World comes to mind. The use of size in the different monsters really makes each a unique event in my mind, even during periods of grinding the same monsters. You never forget that time you fought that particularly giant Rathalos. The variation here also has me and my friends developing superstitions about how the game works. Do certain monsters have preferences towards fighting styles? It seems like this one uses roar very often, doesn't it? Doesn't really matter if this is actually a feature programmed into the AI, it still changes my experience because I feel like it is. The way Reaper uses variation is more or less as simple as its implementation can be done. Simply, size determines health and damage. You would think that this is pretty boring, and look, it's by no means revolutionary, but I was surprised by how much this actually contributes to my experience with the game. I have distinct memories of certain fights because of the large unique enemy that appeared. For example, fighting this giant worm demon in Artificer Juno's cellar becomes the marker that the endgame had begun in my various playthroughs. Having these kinds of memories shows that the experience was interesting enough that my mind was actually attentive to it. But look, let's strip all else away. Is Reaper's combat good, all on its own? Well, here I'm not so sure. On the one hand, I did enjoy it. It's enormously satisfying to land a good whirlwind that finishes off a bunch of enemies at once. On the other hand, making the main attack an automatic one is a questionable choice. In many cases, it does make the combat feel like a mobile game. One of my friends is a massive Hollow Knight fan, and the combat is somewhat similar between the games. 2D side-scrolling melee with abilities. I had him play this game for this video as well, both for the footage, so if I suddenly get very bad at the game, you know who to blame. And also for his impressions. Let's, uh, let's hear what he has to say. Hey, uh, Connor, what did you think of, uh, Reaper's Combat? This game is absolute garbage. Yeah, see, he, uh, he loves it. Okay, but in all seriousness, he found Reaper's Combat very frustrating, as is evidenced from the file names he used in the footage he sent me. He hated how the dash had no invincibility frames, and how so many enemies filled the sky with bullets that it was just safer to play very slowly on the ground. Now, I can't help but be a bit, you're just playing it wrong here. At its core, Reaper is not Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight is a masterclass in 2D combat, Reaper is a goddamn mobile game. I can't help but notice how little Connor goes out of his way to collect gold, so maybe his gear was behind in a way that didn't let him take hits that I might have just shrugged off. On top of that, he rarely uses the Whirlwind attack, which I found to be the most effective ability in the game, and particularly effective against the aerial enemies he hates so much. That being said, should a game be let off the hook just because its systems coincidentally happen to work better with my playstyle? The ultimate outcome is that Connor did not really enjoy the game. I think I ultimately have to take his side in saying that the game's combat leaves at least a bit to be desired. Honestly, I think a few small changes would be massive improvements to this combat system. Imagine this, the auto attack is removed in favor of an attack that is in control of the player. Then, that attack becomes directional, like it is in Hollow Knight, adding a massive dimension along which players can improve. Finally, the dash grants some iframes. The exact number of frames and distance can be tweaked during balancing, as with the directional attack, but I think that just these two changes would go a long way towards raising the skill ceiling of this combat system. To account for the increased power this gives to the player, enemies should be more plentiful and projectiles should deal slightly more damage. Increases to enemy movement speed and attack rate might be good as well to account for just how versatile the player would become. These changes would turn the combat system, and by extension the game, into a meaningfully rewarding experience. Of course, it's very debatable whether these changes make sense for a mobile game. They probably don't. 
Ultimately, I think that the combat system here is actually quite advanced for a mobile game, especially released so long ago, but I think that, especially on PC, the game's design had quite a lot of unmet potential. The other half of Reaper takes place on the Wilderness map. Here you will find shops selling gear to upgrade your stats, you'll find the Witch who will take a small fortune to give you a free level up, with the accompanying tarot card drawing, which improves one aspect of your character, and eventually the Torkin Arena, where you can take on increasingly difficult waves of Torkin fighters in return for lots of gold. And of course, to the east, you'll find isolated mountains, in which a Reaper has just awoken inside of a cave. As you venture into the wilderness, it is immediately made clear that the different factions are far from united. What's more, they're not even really good people. The Zavas tribe has succumbed to the Imperial advance, and while the Elder tries to keep the peace, a group of radical Zavas warriors have formed their own group and regularly terrorized their own tribe. The Morka are mad with power, receiving the most magical prowess of any tribe, and their ideology becomes increasingly radical. The sheer magical might of the tribe drives their leaders to insanity and grants them near invincibility in combat. The Fracco tribe might be the most blameless in all of this, but there is a reason that their island is known as the Isle of Madness. The Okori are just brutal. In one mission, they sent you to assassinate an Imperial official by delivering a flower to him. He takes a whiff, and his goddamn head explodes. <laughs> The Torkid are just kind of stupid. Having received less of the wilderness magic than any other tribe, the Torkin have become a tribe of warriors, valuing bravery and courage above all. And I really mean above all. They're downright foolhardy and have become completely indifferent to death. They regularly die by the dozens, by the Reaper's hand, in their own arena. And they pay you for the privilege. The wealthy Pakora tribe, loosely masterminding the wilderness war against the Imperials, has their leader assassinated and replaced by the assassin from within the clan. This leader only cares about his own goals and the tribe's own gold reserves. And don't even get me started with the Imperium. Your first encounter with them occurs when you carry a wounded soldier back to their camp, only for the colonel to order him shot and pay you off. Putting aside the original sin of being the aggressors, they're a true autocracy through and through, at the Emperor's command back in their homeland. The soldiers and citizens of the Empire are completely disposable. They are ruthless in their advance, and have no problem with scummy tactics. At one point, the Lord Protector Orlando, the top Imperial official in the wilderness, hires you to slaughter his own camp in order to generate fear in the mainland and leverage it to increase taxation for the raising of larger armies. If you refuse, he sends orders to the camp ahead of you to attack you on sight, forcing your hand in self-defense. The factions only care about their own interests and have no issues with sabotaging each other to advance. In the face of a common imperial threat, faction elders hire you to hurt the other tribes to advance their own standing. Later in the game, with the appearance of demons threatening everybody, they still have no interest in helping each other. Aster, the Torkin Elder, hires you to slaughter the specters raised by the Morka tribe, a major military asset, because he believes that this will show the wilderness that his tribe is more deserving of them. Interestingly enough, there are a fair number of morally good characters, but they're always just that, single characters, morally good when divorced from the larger structures in which they belong. And they exist in all factions. Miko the blacksmith and her sister, Juno the artificer, imperial citizens who have set up small stores in the wilderness, largely irrelevant to the events of the game, but they care for each other and for their friends, like Private Milo, an imperial soldier who defects after falling in love with a wilderling, Zorka of the Morka tribe, the daughter of the village elder, another example of good characters. The thing to note is that these characters are mostly powerless. I don't think it's virtuous to be harmless, necessarily. Milo is a morally good character, I think, but it could have hardly turned out any differently. He's a naive, shy, and frankly pretty weak guy. He couldn't have been evil. That's not virtuous exactly, it's just being harmless. When the organizational structures gain power, they become corrupted by it. It's the power that allows the Morka to act in reckless, power-hungry ways that they do, and it's wealth and by extension power that turns the Pakora into self-serving schemers. The Imperials can only act in the way that they do because of the war machines backing them up. I actually think this portrayal of humans is, is great, because I think that the nature of humans is somewhat like this in many ways. Don't get me wrong, it's not exactly as simple as power corrupts or any other saying like that. Humans are more complicated than that. Power has some effects, for sure, but what they are specifically depends massively. In some cases, power does corrupt those who wield it, but by no means in all cases. Again, humans are more complicated than that. 
but I think that human organizations tend to act a little bit more like this. It's still by no means a hard and fast rule, but an institution could be at least a little bit more predictable than the sum of its parts. About halfway through the game, historian Joe, an academic from the Imperial College, asks for your help in investigating the history of the wilderness, and in doing so discovers another lost tribe, the Coco tribe, a tribe of wilderlings that were given no magic at all. They split from the Torkin tribe to find their fortune outside of the wilderness. This tribe is, of course, the ancient ancestors of the Imperium, meaning that despite their current divisions, everybody in the wilderness is of a common people. Once, the Coco tribe's lack of magic forced them to leave the island. They returned with power under different circumstances unbeknownst to themselves. When they first appeared, the Wilderlings fought bitterly, but they would have been overwhelmed eventually. It was the mining of Fluidium and the release of magic back to the tribes that gave them power and allowed them to become what they are in the game. When the Poetan had armies and leverage, facing an English settlement that was poorly defended and reliant on them for food, they attacked the town and slaughtered hundreds. Over the next centuries, the English crown returned with progressively more powerful guns and soldiers, facing a progressively weaker native population suffering from a whole host of illnesses. They used their power to slaughter the natives, becoming what they decried in their newspapers. This is no judgement on the moral issue, and I think that it's difficult to argue that one side did not commit much worse actions over the latter half of the second millennium, but it is a demonstration of how power affects human organizations. The Reaper seeks his own nature throughout the game, trying to understand what or who he is, and he arguably fails at the end, simply walking away from the final fight completely devoid of a purpose. But it's this lack of purpose that best defines his nature. He appears and brings with him demons, while the humans with a common ancestry fight selfish wars. He leaves in his path nothing but death. He's not just a swordsman, but a Reaper of souls, created by the humans that fear him so much.